what what's cooler <laughs> being a, a a professional tony hawk pro skater player or being a pro skater. I mean, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I love how Alex takes the question seriously. He's like, "Well, Chris, let me give you the pros and cons of each one." <laughs> let me put my Venn diagram together for you. And welcome to episode 91 of the Game Brew Podcast, the bi-weekly video game podcast where we sip delicious beers, discuss video games, and save the planet. I am your host, Ian Mati Richard, and I'm joined by Chris Wheeler Wrights. Fire! And Alex Linka Writer. Wind! And with your powers combined, I'm sure that Allison is Captain Planet. Today, in the first half, we'll talk about the elements in gaming, and in the second, we'll discuss the big revelations from the Xbox Series S and X out this week. But first, it's time for a beer. Chris, what are we drinking? Uh, Well, we're drinking different element-themed beers, I guess. Um, Yeah. So I picked... uh, Flying Dogs Thunder Peel. Nice. Yeah, because like thunder, electricity. Yeah. Like a peel of thunder, how thunder yeah. goes boom. And yeah, it's a it's a, <laughs> it's a hazy IPA. I think it's, yeah, 6.2%. Hazy IPAs, as our listeners probably know, have been my Jimmy Jam for a little bit, so... They've kind of been everybody's Jimmy Jam for a little while. It's the beer. It's the beer of 2018 to 2020. I would say beer of the year, but it's been longer than a year. Yeah, but I don't know. They're super refreshing. They're juicy. They're tasty. They're not as super crazy hoppy as as other IPAs, so I like them. Yeah, there was like the hoppiness resolution and the or revolution, and then hazy IPAs were like, yeah, but be chill about it. <laughs> yeah, like okay, we've gotten that out of the way. Let's let's you know actually enjoy this now instead of just destroying your taste buds. Yeah. So what's what's that particular one doing for you? It's tasting pretty good. I mean, it's got a lot of the juiciness. It's not too sweet, but it's got a little bit s- sweetness to it. It's just a, a good salad beer from Flying Dog. Flying Dog has a lot of great stuff. They do. I really like it. Also, they use all this art from, from the same artist. It's always like really crazy can art and stuff like that. You should check it out if you uh, haven't checked it out before. Speaking of artists, do, is it okay if we take a second to just talk about the people Ooh. on the cast of Captain Planet? Because it's ridiculous. Okay. Okay. Are you ready for this? Okay. So... Meg Ryan is on Captain Planet. <laughs> what? Yes. Meg Ryan is Dr. Blight. LeVar Burton is uh, Kwame. I, I knew that. Yeah. I Tim knew that. Curry is Mal, the AI. What? Yes. Martin Sheen is one of the bad guys. Who the hell else is in this? Uh, Whoopi Goldberg is Gaia, obviously. Like, this is oh, Jeff Goldblum is vermin is scum. Like literally the people they managed to get on this animated kids TV show is ridiculous. Yeah. You that can, is kind you, of amazing. Wow. I had you no can idea. Make, like an incredible art house film with the actors from Captain Planet. <laughs> <laughs> you could just make uh, a, a in general really good film. Yeah. Pretty pretty incredible stuff. I had no idea. I know. Now I, it makes me want to go back and John Ratzenberg. Who's that? Uh, I believe he's been the guy that isn't been in like every Pixar film. So he was Ham. He was Mac in uh, Cars. Like he's he's literally had a voice in, in every Pixar film. Huh. Things that we take for granted as children. That's right. Um, I'm drinking uh, Heart and Science by Ninkasi Brewing Company, which is a pretty Northwest brewer. And it's a West Coast IPA. So similar to like a hazy IPA. And it's pretty juicy at the beginning, like very, I wouldn't say citrusy, but juicy is good. It's almost got like a melony thing going on. Uh, And then you get some hops in the middle, but it's pretty chill. Like it's, it's a drinking IPA. It's one that you could really spend an evening with. It's almost like all day IPAs, but a little bit. Like a session? Yeah, it's almost like a session. It's almost like an uh, an all day IPA that just has a little bit more melon to it. It's nice. It's really good. It sounds cool. And then because this beer is just so bitter, I have to chase it with some fireball. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Got to get those elements in. Mm, Got to get those elements in. Wow. That tastes like candy. That's really bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, what do you got over there, Alex? So I'm drinking 21st Amendment Brewery's Heller High Water 
melon. Yes, this is one of my favorites. <laughs> so that is good. Water was my chosen element for that. It's a wheat beer brewed with watermelons, mm-hmm. and uh, really, I would just call it a subtle watermelon juice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not as much beer. Just in the time that we've cracked the can, I'm already like three quarters of the way done my first beer. <laughs> Does that um, have to do more with a beer or more to do with you? Uh, column A, <laughs> column B. I did, I did just finish mowing my lawn like a little bit ago, so it's like a little bit refreshing. There you go. Um, yeah, that's a good beer. It really is. It's, and it's unique. Like I haven't had a, another beer like it. No. It's definitely very unique. And it's the first sip, it almost tastes like that fake watermelon flavor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then like after the second or third sip, you're like, oh, th- all right, this this tastes fine to me. It doesn't taste like the fake candy from our childhood. Has Amber tried it? Because she's super into watermelons. So I got some extra for for her to try as well. Nice. I feel like like I feel like the beer has had a, a fruit renaissance. Like there's all different kinds of fruits and beers, you know, pineapple, watermelon, dragon fruit. But like when is the vegetable beer renaissance happening? Like I want mm. I want we had a beet a beet beer. The Bloody Mary of hops. Yeah, a beet beer. I was thinking like we a had cucumber. That. A cucumber beer could be really good. We had um Magic uh, Hats. Yeah, the Magic uh, Hat. Was it the love or something like that? Oh man, uh, I can't remember what it was called, but it had beet juice in it. Um, if someone makes, so it was like pink. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> if someone makes a celery beer, it better have negative calories. That's all I have to say about that. Well, if you want to get super technical, <laughs> Fly Dog has an Old Bay beer, and one of the main ingredients in Old Bay is celery seeds. So, hey, hey. <laughs> that's hilarious. Uh, but yeah, those are the beers. So what have we been playing this week? I Actually, no, I, I need to go to Alex first because I feel like this week was like the biggest week of the year in terms of video game releases for you, Alex. It was. <laughs> and tell us why. So this week I have played probably 15 hours of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2, the, the remake reboot. It is everything that I wanted in the game. It's great. Uh, the graphics are fantastic. Yeah, they they brought back so much of the original soundtrack, and there's there is some new tracks added in there as well. I've had Superman stuck in my head <laughs> nonstop. <laughs> I think in less than six hours, I beat Tony Hawk One and Tony Hawk Two. Jeez, like all levels complete, everything collected in those levels, and wow. So there's three sections. There's Tony Hawk One, Tony Hawk Two, and ranked. And so the ranked section is where you high score levels so you do a two minute run get as high score as possible it was cool because i got the game right when it came out after i beat tony hawk one on the first day then i (laughs) i went into i went into the ranked and played that for a little bit and i was like number 200 for a couple of the levels that's awesome um but that was just because it was the first day and no one had done it yet Um, (laughs) no no you're 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 top 200 in the world my friend Honestly, I'm I'm excited for you to compete at Magfest 2022. Yes. <laughs> oh. oh, sad day. Listen, you've got time to train. I do. I have lots of time to train. I will say it's pretty ridiculous. There's some guys in the online multiplayer that I've played against that have scored like two million points in a run. Jeez. That I, I just I have no idea how they do it. Hopefully one day my thumbs will cooperate with me enough that I will be able to reach that level of high scoriness. <laughs> I believe in you. Do you get to watch their run as it's happening? I can see how many tricks they've done in their combo and what their score is currently. Okay. Um, and there's there's multiple different variations of like the multiplayer that you can do. And they still have to flush it out a little more, I think. it's Doing the multiplayer is super clunky. Um, I was playing with Brian the other night, but then you still get thrown into random matches with other people Hmm. and you get thrown into a random level and it's a random multiplayer game type. You can't like create a closed, a closed room or anything? Not yet. No. Do you know if they're going to like support it? Like, are they, do they have post launch support coming or is it kind of like, it is what it is? Yeah, they've, uh, they have said that there's a couple updates that are coming. There's going to be some patches coming out. I will say that 
everything that they upgraded, they did a really good job of. So the graphics look phenomenal. The physics feels great in the game. Stats make a whole lot of sense. Like if you increase your your air stat, you actually get more air in the half pipe. So you can really you can really feel the kind of the granularity from those changes making an impact. Yep. Yeah, and the haptics are cool too. So it's like if you bail or if you like grind, it's like you feel a little tiny bit in the controller like when you make contact with the rail, which is cool. Oh, and that's probably new from like DualShock days. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it was this is before DualShock days. This was PlayStation 1. Oh my god. So. What about our <laughs> What about the Rumble Pack? <laughs> Only on N64. On, on, I did play that with the Rumble Pack on N64, and there were times <laughs> where the game would glitch out and it would just like keep rumbling. And <laughs> yeah. oh my god, the times when ugh. back back in our day, kids, the Rumble Pack used to be an add-on that you had to yeah. buy and then plug <laughs> into the controller. Is what they mean by Rumble Pack. <laughs> Sorry for the the long story of Tony Hawk, but basically, I'm I'm trying to become a competitive Tony Hawk skater now that they have this. So I'm spending a lot of time doing this. So here's, here's, here's a question that I want to wrap this up on our Tony Hawk mini cast. Oh, and there will be a mini cast coming. Oh oh my God. So here's the question is if you've never played Tony Hawk one and two before, is this worth picking up? Uh, I would say yes. So for me, I finished the game fairly quickly because I still have the muscle memory from my years of of playing Tony Hawk, I still strongly believe that. I mean, it's an arcade game. It, it's a it's a mm. now it's a, a very high quality graphic arcade game with a killer soundtrack that you can pick it up and play for just a couple two minute runs, or you can be like me and lock yourself in your room for eight straight hours and play Tony Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> I I nice. like the game a lot. Very I highly cool. recommend it. Highly recommended. Uh, Chris, do you have anything that you've been doing this week? Perhaps uh, slightly more quickly than the. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I, I'll, no, no worries. <laughs> it's important. Oh, and I'm um, supposed to be the timekeeper. Uh, <laughs> so um, much for that. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to mention. So, uh, last podcast, I talked about Remnant from the Ashes. Yep. I ended up finishing that with Ian. Woo woo! Um, yeah, that's what it is. It's been a little bit for me. Again, it was a, a good third person shooter in the Souls like genre. It was pretty good. It was. I, I, I thought it was a little short. You didn't think it was, but I felt like it was. No, I I think it was a little like it just kind of ended. Like it was very clear that they were like, we're just gonna keep making levels until we run out of money, and then whenever we run out of money, we're just gonna be like, and that was the end. <laughs> it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's like if you got to like three quarters of the end of Sleeping Beauty, and then they were like, and uh, then she kept sleeping, and that's the end. <laughs> yeah, because we got to that hub area. We got to that hub area, and there was like two branches off of it, or something like that, where it felt like there could have been so many more. Oh, oh, yeah. They could have done infinite hub branches off that. Yeah. I thought that, like, the gameplay in that game was really satisfying. And to the extent that they managed to differentiate the weapons and the abilities, like, it was successful. I think it could have done with a lot more enemy variants. Like, they looked different a lot of the time, but generally they were, like, the, the things that ran at you and were squishy. They are the kind of reskinned. things that shot you and were medium. Yeah. Or the things that were slow and sort of, like, lumbered along and shot at you far, far away. So... All in all, I would love to see a remnant from the ashes too, and like not even worry about uh, assets so much as just uh, expanding, like the different things you can do with weapon upgrades and then and the different enemy types and not expand gameplay but expand assets basically more bosses more different well there's a lot of bosses types. there was a fair amount of bosses and that's one but of the things my that, bosses were different than your bosses is the main yes, thing and that's that, that's what was uh, really cool that um, was the best thing. Yeah, wow. for sure. So, and that that kind of enhances the replayability because, like, we can finish my game, go to your game. We could have some completely different bosses than I had. There's there's right. some that'll be the same, but there's also a lot that'll be different. Yeah, mm. and I also think it's a good entry for people who wanted to get into the Dark Souls genre, oh. who are like coming from a Gears of War kind of place. You know what I mean? Like if you if you're like, oh, man, I've hear, heard about Dark Souls, but I've always been afraid of playing it. Then this is the thing that you can use to get into it. Man, two in one episode, huh? I, I'm, I'm over it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and I, I mean, I think the other thing is that the, I really like that they emphasized co-op. Yeah. To the point where I don't think I'd really like to play that game much by myself. It's it's much better with co-op. Much better with friends, I would agree. The other things that I have been up to are Trine 4. I'm about 90% of the way through Trine 4. Trying what? What? What were you trying? Try. <laughs> <laughs> The video game Trine, <laughs> the fourth entry in the series, which is like a platform puzzler, which is really great for couch co-op in case you're into that kind of thing. It's pretty new. Yeah, it's pretty new, but the Trine series have been around forever, and they're all, yeah. aside from Trine 3, which kind of like tried to go like super 3D, they're all pretty similar in terms of like what you're looking at. You kind of know what you're getting into with a Trine game, but it's all good. Puzzly platforming, and it's great. And, and like cute little stories. Like it's very kid appropriate, family appropriate. If you have cousins or something that you want to play a game with and not play like Rocket League or Fortnite, this is a good thing to look into. Hmm. And then also I've been spending some time with Legends of Terra, which is basically the League of Legends uh, CCG. Sorry, it's the CCG cast again. <laughs> um, which I will describe this game as just being like a plethora of keywords. And that is most of it. It's really great, though. It's kind of like if you smash Magic the Gathering, like the sort of more complex turn rules for Magic the Gathering and Hearthstone together, you would get something like Legends of Runeterra. It's complex. It's interesting. It's also super colorful and flashy. I would recommend to our CCG friends out there. Really generous reward system. Love that about it. And then the other thing that's really like got its claws into me right now is Satisfactory. Do you guys know what this game is? No. Is it like Factorio? No. It's like Factorio except 3D, and I can't stop playing it. Oh, uh, I think I just saw your brother post a picture of this. Yes. And I ridiculous. just assumed it was fucking Astroneer. No, it's not. It's like, <laughs> it's what's funny is the reason we came to this game is because we were doing something in Astroneer. We were trying to make Astroneer just print items. And this whole game is about printing items. It's, oh it's, my gosh. If you like just managing logistics and like creating factories, this is the game for you. Please go play it. You will not be disappointed. Otherwise. So it's like, it's like a 3D printer, but you don't get anything. It's like a 3D <laughs> printer that you don't get anything from, except for, <gasps> wait for it, Satisfaction. satisfaction. Ah. <laughs> but I can't get no satisfaction. Oh. Na, na. You could if you played that game. Huh. But I'm really enjoying that. Love that it's co-op, still in early access, but it's completely worth the $30. And I can't believe I'm saying that. So that's my little man sweet speech about games lately. There's a lot of yeast at the bottom of my glass. I don't know how I feel about that. Are you going to drink it? You're looking yeah. at it like you're going to drink it. <laughs> man, that looks awfully sludgy. <laughs> Well, it's a hazy IPA. That's like half the the thing. It's That's why it's hazy. Type. It's unfiltered. That's right. It's like half the calories. That's why you got to get it down. All that yeast poop. Speaking of yeast poop. Sp- no, that, that, that <laughs> oh, transition does that not was work. A, that, that was a solid Ian transition. I don't know that what you're talking about. <laughs> Speaking of Ian transitions. <laughs> So we are all familiar with like the tossing of fireballs by mages or mages like using different elements, fire, ice, water, what have you. Um, And that's been kind of a centerpiece for gaming for years now. All kinds of different games across genres have used this. But what is it about uh, the elements in gaming that makes them so ubiquitous? Uh, And we kind of wanted to also think about like what are some games that have used the elements to great effect? And this came up because Chris uh, was sort of thinking through the Borderlands series and of course the most recent entry and got us thinking about the elements in games. So Chris, what is it about the elements in the Borderlands series? that made you want to talk about this? Well, first I want to clarify that I, I saw this on a Reddit thread, um, and that's what made me actually start thinking about Thanks, it. Reddit. Um, Thanks, Reddit. Thanks, <laughs> Reddit. But, I mean, it was it kind of made me, me think about how elements were used in games and, and, and why does, if you're using something that has electric damage, why does that remove shields faster? I mean, that one kind of makes sense, I think, because, you know, like maybe like an EMP type discharge thing is removing some of the electrical components or something. I don't know. Discharge. Discharge. Um, (sighs) Or like, why does fire mean that you're going to take more like health damage or why does corrosive mean you're going to take more armor damage? And and how does that kind of almost, 
I don't think economy is the right word, but kind of rock, paper, scissors work. And, and, yeah. and why, why is it like that? Why yeah. was it deemed that this means this? Hmm. So what is the why, Chris? What is your why for that? I mean, I, I think some of them make sense. I'm not sure. I feel like the fire one was just thrown in because they were like, okay, well, shields, that makes sense. Okay, corrosion uh, corrosion on, like, iron. Okay, I, I can get that armor, iron. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, like, the fire one just doesn't really make that much sense to me. I mean, I, a lot of times you see fire damage represented as, like, damage over time, like in Remnant. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but I also think it's just, like, to me, thinking about it from from where I would come from if if I were a game developer, which clearly I'm not. You're not, but it's just like it seems like a way, especially in Borderlands, it seems like a way to like force you to pick up a different weapon, right? Because if you walk into an area where all of the enemies have strong shields, then you're like, okay, well, I need I need my electric element so that I can beat up these guys with shields, right? Mm-hmm. Or right. Uh, as a way, you know, to like make you swap through things without making you feel and making you feel smart doing it, right? So if you're just getting a weapon upgrade, but you really like the weapon you had before, you're like, oh, I miss my old weapon. I like the way it shot. But if they're like, oh, ho, ho, if you, you need electric to shoot this and then you go find an electric gun, it doesn't matter what the gun shoots like. You just feel smart because now you have equipped an electric gun. Mm-hmm. See, and it, it sometimes got in the way, especially in Borderlands 3, because there were guns that I didn't like the way they felt. I didn't like the way they shot, but I had to use them because right. of the properties they had. I kind of didn't like that because it, it kind of pigeonholed me into using something that I didn't want to. Yeah. I wonder if that has to do with like the element designer in the game or if that's more something that's like, well, like the look, the feel, the operation of that gun just didn't feel right because of the operation of that gun. You know what I mean? Well, I think it's just uh, just how with a lot of their randomly generated guns, it just happens that way. Like sometimes they just don't feel good, I think. Yeah, I agree. Alex, do they have elemental boards in Tony Hawk? <laughs> well, <laughs> Ele- Element is uh, one of my favorite skateboard oh, companies. Oh, here we go. <laughs> nice. Which I will say in the reboot, I'm very sad with the lack of actual element boards. So they have like their standard graphic, but they don't have like a fire board. They don't have a water board. They don't have. See, it makes me sad because those those are Here's... those are my favorite. Well, I know why they don't have a water board. Oh my god! Because waterboarding's not okay. <laughs> waterboarding's <laughs> not. <laughs> but <laughs> also, I appreciate that. Like my jokey, let's go to Alex about Tony Hawk the, again. I you then it. turned into no, 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 no. I can talk about this with Tony Hawk. Let's, let's, uh, Tony it all Hawk leads back to Tony Hawk. It does it all leads uh, back everything to Tony leads Hawk. back to Tony Hawk? What's the first game that you can remember that had like elemental interactions? My mind went immediately to Daggerfall because you could like make different kinds of spells, and the elements were pretty present in that. Mm. Okay. I remember. Did you ever play Golden Sun? No. What it was a Sun? it was a Game Boy Advance game first, but basically it had two parts, and the first part had two temples. I think it was an Earth and an Air temple, if I remember correctly. I probably am not, but basically you had like all these different powers that you could do. It was a puzzle solver slash JRPG. And in the overworld, you would have like, you would see a puddle on the ground. You'd have to, you know, make that a, a pillar of ice or you'd have to use your different elemental oh. powers to interact with the environment to solve puzzles in between like kind of fighting your JRPG fights. Hmm. That's really cool actually for like for a game of that era. And now that I'm actually thinking about it, RPGs kind of have a really strong tradition of using the elements in interesting ways. Chrono Trigger comes to mind where you're sort of like combining different elemental powers with other characters to make super strong things. Okay, yeah. Um, and Golden Sun had that too. Like you would have they were called gin and you could like use a certain amount of gin and you would combine two of your characters gin to create like a super move that you would do. It was really cool. Yeah, that is really neat. It's also been really fun to watch sort of in recent years with like the open world gaming renaissance to watch the elements be really represented in different ways. Right. And I think sort of like the pinnacle of this is thinking about how the elements interact in Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. So like when you light a fire, 
in Breath of the Wild, it like can light a forest on fire, which then creates wind, which you can use in your kite to like fly around to other places. That was super cool. Yeah. And like, and like the frost is like a way, like water is also a way for you to like interact with the environment and create platforms Mm -hmm. and like electricity and hooking things together. And like, like they really took the elements to a place that felt really organic and like it worked within an ecosystem instead of just like this stat affects this stat. Which is fine and cool, but m- more interesting in terms of like how the developers played with those effects. Yeah, mm-hmm. I could honestly probably play a whole game based on just kind of those elemental interactions. I remember like a silly like in browser game where you would like just start with like water and air or something like that, or like four, the four elements or something like that, and you could just start combining them. So like water and air would give you wind. And like, mm-hmm. oh. and like you could continue building new things, like new elements, basically, that you continue yeah. to build other things. And I, I don't know why it was so satisfying, but it was. It was like a puzzle game again, but trying to figure out what different pieces built the next piece. Yeah. Kind of like Minecraft building, too. That is really cool. Oh, in what way? Um, in that, like, if you use like three sticks, you get a larger piece of wood or like if you combine three sticks and a a rock in a certain way you get an axe Uh, okay Mm -hmm. have you all ever heard of a game called magica m-a-g-i-c-k-a i have so magica is interesting because it's basically it's like a game about wizards and it's it's got like a four-player co-op thing going on or like a tournament based thing but basically like the spell casting in this game is that you combine two different elements or more to make like a new spell. So like when you're selecting things, like it's, it's based on QWERTY cause it's, it's a PC game, but like you post like a for lightning and R for fire and hit those both things at the same time, then hit cast and it'll do like a fire slash lightning spell. Right. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's like, depending on which elements you choose to combine is the spell you get. So it feels like you're kind of an alchemist mixing things together, which was kind of a neat method. And I also think, in terms of mixing the elements, the Divinity games do a really good job of like making the elements matter. I don't know if you guys, I mean, Chris, you played a little bit of Divinity, probably more than me, actually. Uh, I played more of Original Sin too. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it had a lot of that interaction where like if there was a puddle on the ground and you shocked it, then people would be stunned in it. Also, mm-hmm. why, why? I mean, I guess, I, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> Chris is not happy. Well, no, like why? Why? Like if you get shocked, do, I mean, I, I guess like when like a stun gun uses electricity to shock people and, and stun them. But yeah, because water is can. Well, right. water is not a good conductor, but the like minerals in water are conductors. So any water that is not like purified will conduct electricity. Also, side note, there's a Magic of Vietnam DLC. What? <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of wild. Well, um, Speaking of Vietnam, there's no punji pits in the uh, Tony Hawk reboots. Nope. What's up with that? Nope. Someone... You, can't, you can't ollie over them? No, there was... You can't ollie over punji pits anymore. I think there was there was a level of QC that was, was reached. Someone decided that finally wasn't okay. That is not okay, yeah. But yeah, there's some games that just don't do them well. Another game kind of early in our childhood that used elements. Pokemon had a lot of those those elemental kind of rules built into their battleground oh my god for sure because water would do more damage to fire fire would do more damage to grass grass yeah yeah. grass pokemon that's one where in some games there's a way to balance it out if you don't have that skill you can kind of change things in in your inventory in order to to compete against it but i feel like in in the Pokemon world, it was either use a different Pokemon or you're going to get your your butt kicked. So there there wasn't as yeah, much for the, like oh, for, variation absolutely. In, in that. But I mean, and Pokemon needed to be mentioned, right? Because Pokemon's gameplay is built re- like around this concept. Mm-hmm. That's exactly how all of Pokemon's ga- gameplay works. And it is very much the rock, paper, scissors. You need to use a different Pokemon to get this. So go collect more Pokemon, mm-hmm. right? The game is collecting Pokemon. And if all the types worked equally well against all other types, you would only ever need one super strong Pokemon. And it's, but they don't. It's interesting that both that and Borderlands kind of have that same element where they're 
got to catch them all element. Yeah, like they're they're trying to make it so that you go out and get more stuff. Yeah. And incentivizing that. But really that I mean that's what that's what any game with any of these elemental features has. It's like Well, I wouldn't say that about like Breath of the Wild. It's not no, like no. making you go out to get those things to do the thing. No, but if you do go out to get those things, like if you if you do get wood, then you can build fire. And you can't build fire without the wood. And so if you want to do certain things, you still have to go collect items and add them to your inventory and and you have to stockpile them if you want to do that multiple times. You're kind of right, Alex. There's either like the catch them all or like the this is how we like we want you to diversify how you're doing things Mm -hmm. kind of element to elements. Right. And that also like one of the things I love about the Trine series is that they really use the elements in really interesting ways. So like fire arrows like break boxes but the frost arrows can like freeze switches open or turn water into platforms which is a really helpful thing Mm -hmm. so they're like incorporating sort of these like tropes i would say of elements into like a more interesting kind of gameplay i just i i want there to be more i don't i want there to be more elements well i i want there to be more interaction like I, i i feel like we're just scratching the surface of it like I feel like a lot of the times it's like, oh, that's cool. And then that's kind of it. Like, they, it's like kind of like right. they checked the box and then they did. You know what I mean? Like, I, I want I want more. I don't know what. But like, I, I don't know what that looks like. I would love to see more games think, especially as we move into a world where like physics generated ray tracing and also like physics generated liquids are going to be more realistically simulated. Mm-hmm. I would love to see more games play with like liquid physics and do like trying to fill up different buckets by like pushing platforms around or like get a water wheel spinning to push things in a certain way. Like to a certain extent, these things already exist. But I remember one of my like favorite twin stick shooters from last generation of consoles, actually pixel junk shooter. Did you guys play this game? I don't think so. So pixel junk shooter was a like kind of a twin stick space cave shooter puzzler, (laughs) which I realize is a tough way to describe it. Basically we were spaceship and flying around and trying to like shoot enemies, but also solving puzzles with your spaceship and the water physics uh, and like lava physics in this game were incredibly well done. So a lot of the times you'd be like breaking through a wall to make water pour through so that you could put out the fire and the lava below so that you could then rescue the guys down there. And it was really, it was like 2D, like pretty retro looking graphics, but really, really well done in terms of simulating the physics of liquids. And and it just like, it created this environment where you could really like fill up this room with water or fill something up with gas and then put like a fire melt element in it, and then it would explode all the enemies in there. So it did some really cool, innovative things with elements in sort of like a 2D space game that were really neat. So I'd love to see more refined work with liquid physics and light physics moving forward as we get the technology and sort of like the computer crunching power to get that done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. I feel like some of that got, I mean, physics for a while was like kind of leading the charge on that. And I feel like that was kind of, taking a back seat for this last few years. And now that we're getting a a ray tracing, that's kind of coming back a little bit, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Ray tracing, I think is going to be big. I, I I also wanted to say really quick that there's a couple elements, specifically water that in gameplay water is either good or it's bad. Like you can either swim in water and dive down to collect items or like the minute you hit water, you're dead. (laughs) It's so lazy. Mm. I feel like that happens less now. I I feel like you just fall in water and die. Yes. And I think that that's where kind of like Breath of the Wild did a good job of like when you're up in the mountains and the water's cold, you can't be in the cold water for long or or else you would die. Oh, right. Sure. That was kind of a, a cool twist on the play of like water being this friendly environment that we're getting used to being in. But really, besides that, there aren't a lot of other elements that are friendly and like deadly because like fire you can't just like hang out in fire it's like anytime you touch fire you're gonna be injured anytime you touch electricity you're gonna be injured sure and so i feel like that that maybe could be like a cool twist in a game playing around with the niceties of how you interact with the elements not just as weapons but 
in the environment that you're in as well, stepping outside the bounds of normal physics. I wonder if there are any other things aside from like the usual like wind, water, fire, heart sort of situation that you think are interesting or new. Like to me, there are a couple of like the stress and sanity element that you see in games like Darkest Dungeon mm-hmm. is a really interesting kind of new twist and kind of an elemental thing, right? As you get less sane, it's almost like an elemental thing. I wonder if there's like a light and a dark element or something like that that you think is more interesting or could be explored in future titles. Yeah, and it's it's hard because it's like there was kind of in Gears of War 1, there was like, don't go into the, the dark areas or you'll just get destroyed mm-hmm. through that one segment, the Krell or the Krill or something like that. Can't remember exactly. The shrimp. But yeah, they were basically like flying things that couldn't be. They were they were people from uh, Pitch Black, if you've seen that movie, where if, if you're in the dark, you get destroyed. Anyways. Also great video game series, <laughs> or first video game anyway, based on that that movie series. But in any case. But yeah, so it's like, it's weird to have something that would be elemental versus just environment. And I think mm-hmm. that's like something that mm-hmm. has to be distinguished between two. And it's hard to, yeah. to distinguish between them sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. All right. Well, I think uh, that's going to wrap it up for us in the first half. When we come back, we'll be talking about the Xbox Series S and Series X. So stick with us. Welcome to the second half of the Game Brew Podcast, episode 91. We are coming back to our elemental beers. I am drinking Ninkasi's Heart and Science, and I'm really enjoying it. I mean, there's no shortage of really nice drinkable IPAs out there, but if you live in the Pacific Northwest and you're not drinking this beer, you're not doing it right. (laughs) That's what I have to say. Tell me how you really feel. That's how I really feel. It's balanced, it's drinkable, it's got enough hops that I feel good calling it an IPA and not like a hazy IPA. I love it. It's great. Mm-hmm. I'm still on that thunder peel. It's still good. You know, you could call me a yeasty boy, though. A yeasty boy? Oh my God, the yeasty <laughs> boys. If that's not a podcast yet, it needs to be. <laughs> we should start it and we could do, huh, talk about beer. Sounds like a Weird Owl cover band. Apparently, it's a bagel shop. Uh, nice. That's a good name for a bagel shop. Well done. Well done. I would buy bagels from them. I need to find out where they are. Do they deliver during COVID? Super side note. I got a bunch of dice recently. Yeah. And they threw in a free one. It's a D30. That is that is very that's random, a, both in topic and die size. Isn't that odd? I, I just it was sitting next to my computer and I just picked it up and I was like, oh, this is weird. I should talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> that is very strange. What do you use a D30 for? I don't know. I don't think I've heard of any game ever using a D30. I, the only thing I can think of is like, as like for health and magic, if you know you're going to play a life gain deck. Uh, this is saying like if you need to like determine some time things that D30s and D60s can be useful if you think about oh. 30 seconds, 60 seconds. Or or um, like or like a day of a month. Exactly is the other thing oh. that is useful ah, for D30s. There you cool. go. <laughs> Interesting. Nice. That's hilarious. Uh, Alex, how's uh, how's your beer treating you? <laughs> My watermelon juice. It's good. Your watermelon juice, yes. Yeah. Are you with feeling hint, hydrated? With a hint of beer. Yeah, I'm feeling very hydrated. <laughs> That's good. It's fine. Again, it is a drinkable beverage. I wouldn't necessarily call this a beer. Oof, a drinkable beverage wouldn't necessarily call it a beer. We'll see when I stand up. <laughs> is that like a like a... Like, are you shaming it? Um, I don't know. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> I think they did a good job with the watermelon taste, but I'm underwhelmed by the rest of it. Like, I don't get that much of the wheat beer. I don't know. I kind of enjoy it. That's just my opinion. All right, then. Well, let's talk about Xboxes. Xbox. Let's talk about Xboxes, Chris. I'm glad you brought Xboxes up because the second half is about Xboxes. Sweet. <laughs> I, I just want to, I want to reach out to the Microsoft team and I want to say... I want to say thank you for releasing this console on my birthday. Aww. Thank you. I also want to say if the Microsoft team wants to let us test out some of these out, you know, because I know you don't have too many people to do that. <laughs> yeah. We're open. Not to high it. profile people. Not yeah. like us. Yeah. You know, like the average gamer. Right. And talk to us. I'm talking to you, Bill Gates. 
Okay, so Series X and Series S got a bunch of news this past week, and we learned a bunch of stuff that was kind of like, we kind of knew, but we weren't sure. So I wanted to take a second, talk through all of this, and sort of see where you all lied on the next console generation, as usual for right now. This is kind of a Microsoft versus Sony fight, right? Like we have PS5, we have Xbox One, the two different series, but we don't have any entries from Nintendo this year. There's not really like an upgraded Switch going on. We also don't have anything from other parties. There's no Sega. There's no... Atari's coming out with something soon. Is Atari coming out with something? That's what I was just going to say. They had some (laughs) things in the works a while back, but I haven't heard anything in a while. Atari VCS, October 2020. All righty. So we'll see what that's about. But (laughs) New Atari. (laughs) Today, we're going to talk about the Xbox Series S and Series X. So So first thing that I want you guys to respond to is just, we got a price point. We finally got price point for both of these models. The Series X, which is sort of the like 4K kind of pro model of the new Xbox is releasing at $499.99. And the Series S, which is like the digital sort of 1440p model is uh, $299.99. And I'm curious what you all think of that. Like, would you, if you had to buy one or the other, which one would you buy? And like, is this what people in the gaming universe are looking for? So I think those prices are pretty good. So the 1440p thing, just to, to kind of clarify. So so 1440p is about 3.7 million pixels. Um, so that's a, a little less than twice as many as 1080p. Um, 4K is about a, a little over 8 million pixels. So it's 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 more than twice the amount of pixels of, of 1440p. I appreciate you clarifying. It does take a lot more graphical power to push 4K than it does 1440p. So that makes sense because of the relative power of the two consoles, the, the Series S for the, versus the Series X. Mm-hmm. We can get into that more later, but for uh, an entry level, like I just want to play the next set of games, I think $300 is great. And I think for $500 for the the Series X, you're getting a ton of power for the money. Yeah. And definitely like tech specs is something that I want to get into later. And and $299.99, like I just feel really good about that price. Like that is such an approachable price point. And the other super smart thing that Xbox is doing with this generation, and this is kind of buried in the details, but for people who can't like plunk down that amount of cash, they're offering like two years worth of interest-free financing on the console. So I'll- if... I'm going to point out if, that it's not interest free. If, well, that's what I was about to say. If you subscribe to Game Pass Ultimate. So, but also they're charging you more per month. So, like, the total amount of money that you pay per month once you add it all up is more than just buying it outright. Wait, not inclusive of the Ultimate sub? Unless I, I haven't heard of that. But, like, the last thing I heard was that, like, you pay 25 bucks for three years or 15 bucks for three years. And you can have one or the other. I think that was the price point. But basically, you're paying like 50% extra for both of them is what I recalled seeing. I don't... mm, I was just reading about this today. And what I read was that console is interest-free or like the financing is interest-free as long as you're signed up for Ultimate. So you have to pay like the $14.99 or whatever it is for... Game Pass Ultimate, but then you don't pay any interest on the unit itself. So it's kind of like interest, but it kind of is not. So, okay. Xbox All Access for Xbox Series S will cost 25 bucks a month for two years. So that's 600 bucks Uh for a $300 console. But you're also getting Game Pass, though. You're getting Game Pass Ultimate and And the console. How much is Game Pass Ultimate by itself? I think Game Pass Ultimate is 15. Plus, when you think about the Game Pass doesn't necessarily come with gold. So when you factor in that price, then it's actually less expensive if you're going to get all the Game Pass stuff plus gold to do the ultimate sub. It's a little uh, it's a little confusing, I think, is the thing we're learning about this particular topic. But I do like that they're already thinking about financing models for people who can't just out and out plunk down the cash because even like a $20 subscription a month or a $35 subscription month seems like something that someone who couldn't afford the console maybe could commit to over a period of time. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's not a thing. I don't plan to do that, but I think it's interesting that they're already thinking about that. Well, in that case, that's that's better. But yeah, I, I, I guess I just heard the portion about like 
it's 25 bucks a month for the console. And I was like, mm, that's a lot. It's interesting because these monthly subscriptions, like we've seen it in software and we've seen it in software for the past couple of years now. But the fact that they're trying out this model with hardware is yeah interesting to me. Like what happens if you like don't make those payments? Like does Microsoft like send a bounty hunter to come like collect the console back? <laughs> Uh, probably not. They probably just send you to collections like yeah. any other good uh, service that puts yeah. you in debt. But one of the other like drawbacks when I'm thinking about the Series S is that the Series S model only comes with 512 gigabytes of storage. And Warzone right now alone, I think, is like 140 gigabytes or something stupid. And it doesn't have a disk drive. So you have to download the games on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's nutty. And games are just going to keep getting bigger. Yeah, games are just going to keep getting bigger. I actually like the like diskless nature of the Series S. I actually think that's a really cool thing about it. It's a good way to to cut down on price. Yeah, I would say going back to your original question of which one would we actually buy? Yeah, I would be more inclined to get the Series X just to also have that high level Blu-ray player. Really? Hmm. Yeah, just because my current Xbox One is my media center right now. Right. Like I pretty much don't use it for anything else. So yeah. if I, if I continue using it in the same way, I would need to do, you know, the highest level of entertainment content that I could, mm-hmm. which the series S couldn't at this point, because it wouldn't be able to play anything like, right. With but doesn't your Xbox one play Blu-rays right now? It does, but it doesn't play like up to 4k it only plays 1080p. That being said, I only have a 1080p TV, so it doesn't really matter, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that there's a, a cheaper way to do yeah, that. Yeah, but you get to play games, too. Right, and exactly. Playing games in 4K um, sounds like fun. I just need my TV to die. <laughs> like, I've been waiting for it to die forever, and it hasn't. Uh-oh. And I, I have this awesome 65-inch TV, and it just... Chris, if you want to move that TV next weekend to the other side of the room, I can make that happen. Chris, <laughs> you, you just need to throw one of the, like, a bubble rager in your basement. Oh, man. <laughs> Alex, do, you, you could, could use it for mixing in front. Like, you could put it on that wall in front of I you. I could totally do that. And you could that use it for mixing. Fantastic. That would actually solve <laughs> that would solve my um, problem of my monitors uh being in front of my speakers. So yes. Uh Amber would kill me. Nah, it'll be fine. <laughs> What's funny is like you guys are like all about the Series X, and like honestly, I would get the Series S instead. Because the only reason that I'm picking up an Xbox in the first place, that I can see myself buying a new Xbox in the first place, is to play like console exclusives if there even are any there aren't any they're all released on pc now well right which i think is another so really good point right like <laughs> hey well who cares like for, for us like, for like we all have pcs yeah. we don't need this like it doesn't apply yeah and that's one of the big things with this generation right is like microsoft has pushed the envelope with cross platform so far. And this was like the smartest move on their part. Oh yeah. To where now we're even seeing PlayStation exclusives come out for PC, which is a Microsoft platform. Microsoft wants so badly for you to buy into their ecosystem. That's what the, all this is, is them just saying buy into our ecosystem. Yeah. So PS5 is coming out with two different consoles, mm-hmm. one with a disc and one without. And inevitably people that aren't as educated about what's going on will just assume that the Series S and lower level of PS5 are the same. They're not, but they'll see that the price tag on the Series S is cheaper and be like, oh, okay. Oh, I'm getting a Series S because it's cheaper. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah. And and I think this is another interesting area of like strategy where Sony hasn't released pricing for the PlayStation 5 models yet. I think they're getting outmaneuvered. You think PlayStation's getting outmaneuvered? Hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if we see, and it's coming out this week. So by the time you listen to this podcast, I could either be right or wrong, but I wouldn't be surprised to see PlayStation try to undercut the Series X by releasing the like full octane PS5 at 449 instead of 499 as a way to sort of like drive sales in that direction. I could see that, but I kind of think it's going to be 500 and I think the lower level one's going to be 400. Yeah, that's kind of like the mainstream thought, but I'm just wondering how else PlayStation can like remain competitive without having that cross play with PCs. Like so much of the gaming that I do right now is cross platform and PlayStation has been the least likely to adopt cross platform 
capabilities in games. And I just think it's such a shame. And they're, they've historically had better exclusives, though. Uh, they have, but I think socially, gaming has moved on from hard platform exclusivity. So what happened with PlayStation VR? Is that its own thing now? Like, do you have to have a PlayStation 5 in order to play VR? That was one kind of variance that the PlayStation 4 offered, right? That you could get the the headset. Mm-hmm. You couldn't do that with an Xbox. No, it Xbox looks like really it's that, its no. own thing now. Everything that says PlayStation VR still says like PlayStation 4. I haven't seen anything yet about the PS5 and the VR world. That's a good point. Yeah, neither have I. And it, it would be a shame because it did some innovative things. It made VR feel like something you could actually mm-hmm. get in your home without hanging a bunch of stuff in the walls and being really difficult to set up, which was cool. I also worry, like, you know, Chris, you brought up earlier platform exclusivity and how it it kind of is irrelevant now. And aside from Halo Infinite, which was supposed to be like the big blockbuster Xbox exclusive title in 2020, that got pushed to 2021. So, like, what is the reason that you buy a Series X and not a computer? Because it's cheaper and easier. I mean, it might change soon with with new video cards coming out, but I couldn't build something with the same specs the last time we had talked about this. I think it would cost like scraping by. It cost a couple hundred dollars more for me to build it. So I'd have to redo that again to see how that's changed. But the price point for the Series X is really good. And this is kind of, I think, a pendulum swing the other way from the Xbox One and the PS4 where both of those were like equivalent to mid-level gaming PCs when they came out, and that's being generous. Mm. They were just not the most powerful machines when they came out, whereas like the Xbox Series X is like pretty solid, like spec-wise. Yeah, it's pretty beefy. You know, when we're not when we're talking about specs, like the specs feel really good, like the fact that it can push up to 4K streaming and recording at 60 frames, like that's super impressive and really cool. And it's not all just hardware that's going on there. That's also just optimization. Yeah, optimization and software makes a big difference. Because like a computer with the same specs would not be able to run the same thing. Like, right. it just wouldn't. But Right. So here's an interesting question. So the Series S, this is the same price as as a Switch. Yeah. So with the Switch, you have the mobility. Like that. that's the whole thing with the Switch. The games that you're going to be able to play on the Series S are way advanced in terms of of graphics and and game mechanics and compared to what you can do on the Switch. Yeah, but you can't play Animal Crossing on on a Series S. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> and you can't play yeah. Mario. You can't play Zelda. Like that's and that's that's Nintendo's whole thing. Like like yeah, they're never going to win in graphics, but they have the mobility and they have the first party titles that are unbeatable. And really Nintendo only falters on that. If one of their main titles doesn't live up to quality standards. And I don't think they'll ever let it happen. Yeah. Because I don't have a console. I just have a PC right now. That's not true. You have my Wii U over there right now. <laughs> oh, I do. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I do have that. Um, if I had $300, I think I would buy a switch as you should instead of a series S. Because you can play everything that's going to be coming out on the Series S or Series X. Yeah. I wonder uh, if you think that the appearance of the form factor of the S and the X are going to have a play in how well it sells versus the PS5. Because maybe it's just me, but what I've seen from the PS5 is ugly and like the the series x and the series s like yeah maybe they're still like colorless boxes but at least they're not offensive no they're um there's something that you could have like in a a very modern home and i mean they i feel like especially the series s is looks like it was made by nzxt Mm -hmm. yeah like it looks like very like it kind of reminds me of my case yeah it does I, i wonder if that's deliberate as well what do you think about what the PlayStation 5 looks like? They've always kind of tried to look sleek and cool and gamery. But like, I think a big deal is whether it's going to fit in people's entertainment centers at home. That was kind of a problem for me with my uh, amplifier for like my sound system for my TV because it didn't fit in the entertainment center that I had. So I had to like buy a table to put it onto the side. Mm-hmm. And that was, I don't know. 
kind of annoying. Mm. And so, like, I feel like both the Xbox Series X with its vertical sitting thing, I don't know if it can sit horizontal. I, it might be able to. Yeah, it can. But I don't know if the PS5 can. Yeah, it's also designed to be either up or down on the side. It's just like the, those wings, man. But, like, both it of them seem out. like they want to be vertical. Yeah, and they've been trying to push that for years, right? Um, do you think that the backwards compatibility of the X and the S are kind of a big deal? Like the X and S are supposed to be backwards compatible even back through a bunch of PS or a bunch of Xbox 360 titles. Like the PS5 will play many of the PS4 games, which is concerning to me. Yeah. Mm. Well, and that's like what Xbox One had to deal with at first, too, because like people were super pissed that Xbox One was going to play a bunch of Xbox 360 games. And so, like, again, the pendulum swing. Yeah, this one really seems like it's going in Microsoft's favor. My other question, Chris, you know, we were talking about power was in terms of like thinking about the Xbox One X in five years. Is that is that still something that's going to win out over a PC Or do you think that like at some point during the lifespan of the Series X that it's going to like become better to sort of outright buy a PC again? I mean, yeah, that generally happens with every console generation except for the last one. And that's why they had to have the Xbox One X and uh, the PS4 Pro was because they were super weak. I, I think it's not going to age as poorly as this this group has. Mm. I think it and I think it's going to actually push a lot of things forward for PC games too, because they've been kind of sitting at like four threads for a while and we're only finally starting to see multi threaded games now when we've been talking about multi threaded games for a long time. And, and this isn't like a hard and fast rule for teraflops. Like compute power teraflops does not directly correlate to you will get X frames per second. Right. But the Series X has 12 teraflops, which is roughly a Vega 64. Um, I assume it's going to be faster than a Vega 64 or more efficient than it. And the Series X is about four teraflops, which is two teraflops less than the One X, which seems super underpowered. But again, they're not saying it's going to do 4K, which so it kind of makes sense. Right. And it's probably not going to do 1440p 60 frames per second on like big games either. So, like, I'm more worried about the Series S aging poorly. Like, I feel like the Series S is where the Xbox One was when it first launched. So it's kind of like a middle-of-the-road computer. Like, it, it's good. It'll get you to play the new games, but it's not going to, I don't think, age as well as the Series X, which I think will be pretty good for a while. That was a really long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> no, it was, a, it was a good and thorough answer, and I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. uh, Final question for this section goes to Alex. Uh, When they release the new Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 for uh, Xbox One X, what feature must it include? (laughs) Um, Can I I give my answer? No, you asked him. Please. (laughs) Don't answer your question. I want haptic features that uh, actually break your teeth when you fail on a rail grind. (laughs) (laughs) Or... If you could have a new Tony Hawk Pro Skater, yeah. what would that look like in less than five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be able to say four words. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I like where they ended up with Tony Hawk 1 and 2. I think that they need to drastically improve the multiplayer. It has the capability, and I think it has the gameplay mechanics that it could very well be like an online sports game or a online FPS where where people come back to it every day if those multiplayer aspects are kind of worked out and and developed a little more. All right. Well, uh, I think <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to leave it there for this week. Uh, thanks for tuning into the show. If you want to hear more about uh, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, uh, you can find us here on the Game Brew Podcast or you can call Alex at uh, 555 uh, <laughs> Skate. Uh, <laughs> skate. Yes. 555 Skate. <laughs> Uh, in any case, if you want to find us, The Game Brew can be found at thegamebrew.com or at The Game Brew on all the social medias. You can also join our Discord at bit.ly slash Disco Brew. It's been good hanging out with you guys tonight. Uh, this is it. So say goodnight, everybody. Good night, night everybody. everybody. Everybody.